We're all together now. Um, my name is Betsy Anderson, and I'm the executive director of the American Society of International Law. Maybe I'll come over here, and then everybody can see me. Um, I uh, welcome you here to Tiller House. This is our headquarters. So those of you who haven't been here before, it's really a pleasure to have you here and to be organizing this event on the, on the sidelines of the AALS meeting. Um, there's information on your seats about membership in the society. Those of you who are not members, I hope you'll join and uh, also uh, plan to come to our annual meeting, which is scheduled for uh, the end of March, March 28th to the 31st. And we've got one of our co-chairs of the meeting right here, Sammy Payne, who can tell you all about it uh, over the reception. Um, I want to thank the members of our membership committee whose idea was uh, this event tonight, and particularly Anastasia Talasetsky and Harry Osofsky, who I think is uh, due to arrive any second um, for really helping me pull this together. Um, we've got a great panel and uh, uh, really anticipate a very interesting discussion tonight about um, scholarship in international law. And there's really nobody who spent more time thinking and working on uh, scholarship in international law than Lori Damrosch, who is, has been for the better part of the last decade the co-editor-in-chief of our American Journal of International <laughs> Law. And I'm going to turn it over to Lori to introduce our panel and introduce our discussion. Lori. Thank you, Betsy. And thanks to all of you for turning out on a Friday night. I think it's a tribute to the society and uh, to our distinguished panel that uh, we could attract so many of you here on uh, such an occasion. So, uh, yes, as Betsy mentioned, I have been the co-editor-in-chief of the American Journal of International Law for nine years now. Um, gosh, that's almost 9% of the <laughs> lifespan of the journal. We had our centennial um, in 2006, and I wrote the first in our series of centennial essays, so it was a bit of an occasion for looking back over um, how the journal had changed, if at all, from uh, 1906 to 2006. And one thing is there's been a pretty surprising amount of continuity uh, in the format, the style, and uh, you know the basic um, parameters of scholarship. And so here we are now, five or six years later, and we see that so many things are shaking up the way we think about scholarship, the way we do scholarship, um, and the way we project our scholarship to the world. So certainly the American Journal of International Law needs to be reassessing our methods. Um, we'll have a changeover of editors-in-chief starting uh, a year from the spring, so that might be a time for some New thinking. Um, I am a society more generally, I think, has been um, rethinking scholarly uh, products in many different ways, and we have to give a lot of credit to Betsy for bringing us into the electronic age and really assisting us in that uh, transformation. So, uh, now that's my uh, little introduction, and I now just want to say a word or two about each of the speakers. You have their bios on your chairs, so I don't need to go into the uh, details that you'll find there, but I just want to say a few things to highlight uh, what they've done for the American Society in particular. Um, Harold Coe, the legal advisor, everyone knows, he's been especially generous of his time with the American Society. He's favored the Society with um, at least two keynote addresses published in the uh, 2010 and 2011 proceedings, and those have been some of the fullest explications of the legal positions of the current administration, and I think it's been significant that he has uh, unveiled those at our annual meeting. He's also spoken at I don't know how many events in this room. I know he came and spoke to the board of editors of the journal soon after he was uh, confirmed, and I know he's done a number of uh, events, both of a substantive sort and also just for <coughs> mentoring uh, new entrants in the field. So uh, you also know that he was the dean of the Yale Law School, and so we'll be pressing him a little bit on how his shift in roles may have uh, affected his perspectives on um, scholarship and international law. Now, um, to my left, we have another dean, Dean Makawa Matua of the uh, Buffalo Law School. Um, he's also very active in the society, currently a vice president, yes? And um, he had been on the faculty at Harvard and has a um, very major presence in the human rights field and uh, in other fields that intersect with the international law um, area. Next we have um, Diane Amon. She is an immediate past vice president of the society. She has recently made the move from the University of California at Davis to the University of Georgia, where she now holds the Woodruff Chair. And I'm very pleased to say, maybe she'll want to say more about this in uh, her comments later on, but she has agreed 
that she will host, or her university, uh, uh, University of Georgia Law School, will be hosting the research forum to be held in the fall of this year, which is the, uh, this will be the third, well, it'll be the third fall meeting outside Washington, D.C., and the second research forum meeting that the society has sponsored. So we're very pleased that uh, this will be an opportunity for uh, sort of intergenerational review of scholarly papers with uh, younger scholars having an opportunity for uh, more senior ones to comment on their work. So, um, then we have Curtis Bradley, and I believe he's an incoming vice president of the American Society of International Law, having uh, been nominated by the nominating committee, and he will take uh, that uh, office at the spring meeting. Uh, Professor Bradley is currently the Horvitz Chair at Duke Law School. He previously was on the faculty of Virginia and Colorado. He has visited at Harvard. He has been uh, the co-editor of uh, influential case books, both uh, in the foreign relations law area and uh, previously one of the international law case books. And uh, he's a prolific scholar um, and frequent participant, uh, not only in the American Society's meetings, but in just about every venue in the field of international law. I should mention also he served as uh, counselor on international law at the State Department um, during Will Taft's time as legal advisor. So uh, those are some highlights of our speakers. And by um, common acclaim, we will give the floor first to Harold Coe as, in a sense, the person who's the reason why we convened this meeting because we understand that he had some thoughts on his mind. He perhaps wanted to give us a piece of his mind uh, for <laughs> what we could be doing in uh, the professoriate or what we could be encouraging our students to do, uh, what the American society could be doing uh, in order to bring to fruition the kinds of scholarship that would be policy relevant and useful. Um, so. The first question will be, how do we do that? What advice do you have? And the second question will be, uh, when you look back over your time as dean and um, your longtime uh, professorship at Yale, do you think that the incentive structures in the academic world are correctly aligned for the kinds of scholarship uh, that becomes useful to the person who sits in the office where you now sit? Well, thank you. Uh, first, thanks to Betsy, uh, who just does a, such a fantastic job here at the Society. Uh, when I was a young person, the Society was a, a kind of a temple, but frankly, it was very full of itself and uh, old style, not particularly creative. And uh, everything that Betsy has done with a series of presidents and a great staff has made a huge difference. Secondly, um, when Laurie and I were young, we would go to panels all the time where all these old guys would sit around and go, I first met Laurie about 40 years ago. <laughs> and now, basically, I did meet Laurie 40 years ago, but we were still young at heart. Um, I met your brother 40 years ago. Yeah, I met yeah, you yeah. only 38 years ago. Only 38. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, with Kate, the idea for this panel, which was I originally proposed to Betsy, uh, was what I thought at the time was a, a very harsh view I have uh, about the current irrelevance of international legal scholarship to almost everything that I do. Even though I'm an eager consumer uh, and often look at the scholarship and then find it useless. <laughs> but I thought that I didn't want to leave with this uh, grim note. <laughs> so let me say I, uh, two cheers for international legal scholarship. Um, number one, uh, cheer number one, um, we have a very rich brew of legal scholarship in the international law field com as compared to say 20 years ago. Um, the international law field has become interdisciplinary in a real way, empirical, uh, doctrinal analysis is now coupled with historical analysis. Uh, there are schools that cut across uh, continents. Uh, there is transnational scholarship in fields like law and national security, which are genuinely blended. Um, there is advocacy scholarship, uh, which has been quite influential. Uh, there is 
critical scholarship, which I think has exposed some of the flaws and biases of uh, the field. And then there's process scholarship, which as you, you all know, I'm a big fan of, because I think it's, it's something that captures, to my mind, uh, the role that international law actually plays in decision making. Um, Share number two is that this scholarship has actually not just uh, not just um, developed in a a, a group of uh, branches of the academy, but is now attacking some fundamental problems from different perspectives. The compliance question uh, is one I think that has been exposed and vetted from a number of different angles. Uh, the discussion about monism and dualism, uh, articles about the changing architecture of international law. So I think those are the two cheers. Um, the third cheer, which I'm not giving, um, is to what I think has been a, a flaw in international legal scholarship. But the more I think of it, it's not really a flaw with international legal scholarship so much as it's a flaw with legal scholarship uh, writ large. Uh, in this day and age. Um, I don't think this has changed much. Fred Rodell of Yale Law School said there are two things wrong with legal scholarship. One is its form, and the other is, is its content. <laughs> and, uh, rarely do we see a more uh, classic example of that than we do now. Most articles are long, uh, overly complex, user unfriendly, inside baseball preaching to the choir, Americano-centric, and most important, I think, um, irrelevant to solving problems, pressing problems on which international lawyers are actually seeking answers. So what is the cause of this? You know, these are not bad people writing the scholarship, but I do think the incentive structures are all wrong. The students have been ghettoized into international law journals so that if you really want to be an academic, you write not for the international law journals. Junior professors are interested in writing articles for opinion makers on their faculty. You probably know nothing about international law. Tenured professors are often eager to move around uh, and have disincentives to do projects of the kind that they used to do, like restatements, which could be very helpful to international legal practice, but have become increasingly devalued in uh, the world. Uh, peer review journals have lost um, some of their prestige, a lot of their prestige in an age where everybody can publish themselves. Um, and then practitioners uh, who want to do it, if they're serious practitioners, the barrier is now too high. Um, you know, it's very difficult for someone who has a serious international law practice at whatever level, including some of the wonderful people in my office, to sit down and write a 180-page article reviewing all the literature to make the point that you would hope that they uh, want to make. The gauntlet for junior professors has become ridiculous, uh, where you now have to have a fellowship and then a visiting assistant professorship uh, after your Supreme Court clerkship and other things. <coughs> and frankly, you're better off in some cases doing a PhD than you are to actually understand how international law is practiced in the real world. So your major um, move into academia involves uh, distancing yourself from the very phenomenon you're studying and analyzing. Um, so um, my view is that uh, the structures of uh, academia, domestic academia, or whatever you want to call it, uh, are moving away from the kinds of things that actually produce the most helpful scholarship. Um, however, I, I do think there are ways to address it, and a lot of my ideas, and I'll, I'll raise them toward the end, come to this society. Because the American society of international law is quite unique. Uh, there's, I mean, there, there's an American Law and Economics Association, and, but this society has the biggest vintage. Um, it has an internal epistemic community. It has ways to accredit work. It has an annual meeting with a generally international um, focus as a, a journal, which actually produces the most readable scholarship and is the best edited and peer reviewed. The society itself has a blog and 
ASL IL insights. Um, increasingly, you are creating support groups for younger scholars and uh, practitioner scholar groups that talk about difficult topics across the divide, like roundtables on international humanitarian law and other kinds of uh, Chatham House discussions. And I think, uh, as we say in the government, bottom line up front, <laughs> I would suggest that uh, this society self-consciously do a lot more of that uh, to try to redress or address the um, uh, incentive structures. Uh, the reason is quite simple. In an international law, uh, on an American law faculty, and I'm sorry to speak, but this is the American Society of International, I mean, the, the annual meeting of the American Association of Law Schools. Um, there's, you know, not that many international lawyers, and most of the rest of the people don't know what they're doing. And um, so, uh, if this problem is going to be addressed in a way that gets the incentives right and that uh, encourages a different approach to this kind of work, it should come from this group of people when they gather, either at the annual meeting of the American Society or at the annual meeting of the American Association of Law Schools. It's something I would like to, in my dotage, <laughs> spend more time on because I think that it, this is a, a pretty <coughs> crucial crossroads. Because I'll tell you this, <coughs> the international law of the 21st century is being very inadequately elaborated by international legal scholarship. Many of the articles I read could have been written in 1950. <coughs> And frankly, they were more readable, user-friendly, and interesting than written by more prominent people, and were much more helpful and influential. And you know, that's you know, it's we're in 12 years into the 21st century. Um, where is our group on international law and emerging technologies? Where are the people who are talking about the fact that international law has been fundamentally deterritorialized by the internet? Uh, and nevertheless, we still speak about issues such as sovereignty and borders as their, their dominant factors. Uh, you know, we should be getting ahead of the curve. Uh, there is a distinctive American version of international law, but hopefully it would be progressive, intellectually progressive in certain ways that it has not been. And I think it's up to this society and the people in this room to try to tackle those problems. <laughs> Thanks, Harold. Well, you certainly given us a lot to think about in uh, those opening remarks. So I'd like to next uh, turn to the other dean on our panel, current dean, Dean Wotua, and um, ask him if he might offer a few thoughts from the point of view of someone who has the overall responsibility for running a law school, hiring its faculty, training its students, uh, sponsoring all those student law journals and all of those things. Do you see it the same way that uh, Professor Dean, Legal Advisor Co. does or do? <laughs> different? <laughs> different views. Well, thank you very much, uh, Laurie, and thank you, Professor, for organizing this uh, this, this uh, event. Um, you know, there is um, something called decaying on solidarity, and uh, uh, it is rude for me to uh, uh, disagree with uh, with a fellow dean. So I won't do that. Uh, but I think that's not why. I, I just find Harold's uh, you know points uh, really uh, quite on the money in terms of identifying the problems and uh, suggesting what we could do going forward. Um, but one thing that he said earlier, uh, perhaps I'll divert a little bit from, uh, was about the nature of the society. He talked about um, this society having been very stolid and, uh, and stodgy uh, for many years. Um, and I certainly agree with that. Uh, but I think he seemed to, uh, to, to uh, suggest that it had moved much further than I think it has. Um, you know, I just want to say that it, it has a ways to go. I think Betsy, you've done a great job. Um, but I think if I don't speak up, and other people don't speak up, uh, uh, the society will not do the kinds of things that I think uh, Harold is talking about. And there are various aspects of the society that, that you know, we'll talk about later, um, you know, that uh, will bear this up. But let me just say this here, that um, that when we, uh, when we are talking about the problem of international legal scholarship, I think we have to look at ourselves first, uh, you know, as deans, um, as academics, as professors. Um, and, but, but, but I think there's a segment of, of this community that bears most of the blame, uh, which I think has engaged in what I would call uh, 
criteria of intellect, uh, in which I think that uh, certain forms of scholarship are valued, and others are. Uh, you know, so Harold talks, uh, talks about uh, you know the various uh, you know uh, genres of scholarship, uh, traditional, critical, uh, advocacy, and so on. Uh, but there's a pecking order, as you all know. Um, and for those of us uh, in law schools, as, as most of you are, uh, you know that when you send out pieces to be read uh, for a tenure case uh, by uh, senior faculty members in other schools, uh, uh, the kind of response that you get uh, in international law, for example, um, the questions are, are quite familiar. You know, where do you publish your piece? Did you get a piece uh, in, America, in the American Society of International Law? Did you get it uh, into the great international law journals, first and foremost? Uh, and secondly, the journal of scholarship itself. And, and, and quite frequently, I think there is a denigration of, of, of a particular form of scholarship. Uh, in particular, I think uh, scholarship that might be viewed as empathetic um, uh, is not, is not, is not uh, valued uh, you know, as it should be. Uh, so I think the first place to look really is uh, at ourselves, the people who are, I, would, uh, I want to call ourselves self-justifiers. You know, we, you know, we have vested interests. Uh, perhaps we are suffering from the fact that we are hazed ourselves, and so therefore we like to haze others uh, in return. Uh, quite often, I like to think that um, you know, if uh, there was a notion of child abuse, uh, that you know, we could think about for young scholars, I would say that uh, we are abusing many of our young scholars in international law uh, by demanding that they do certain forms of scholarship, they do certain things that I think are really, really meaningless uh, to um, the problems that we confront today. Um, you know, so that's, that's the first point I'd like to make. The second point I'd like to make is really, um, you know, and, and I think we have, to, we have to power ourselves to, to begin to rethink um, you know, um, this self-justification that we engage in, of what kind of scholarship that, that, that we value. Um, and I think deans have a responsibility to speak to their faculty about, um, you know, uh, uh, precisely, you know, this issue, or to lead at least conversations, you know, on, on, on faculties about how to uh, <coughs> rethink, you know, the value of scholarship uh, when it comes to assessing uh, tenure cases. Um, and in addition, um, you know, um, I guess we'd like to talk about a little bit about um, you know the notion of uh, of scholarship that uh, may be viewed as as biased uh, or may be viewed as um, lacking in objectivity. Um, there is a perception, I think, uh, in this society, and I think among many leading prominent international legal scholars. Um, that we should all look at, at the various subjects from 30,000 feet and that we should not, uh, you know, uh, act like citizens, uh, meaning individuals who are involved uh, in the process of social transformation. That somehow it is dirty for us to roll up our sleeves and to think about our subject areas <coughs> as actors as opposed to simply spectators or analyzers um, of, of ideas. And so I think, you know, as far as I know, um, human life has uh, two definite st stages, pre-ideology and then ideology. And then, and then there's, there's this notion that you can be post-ideological. Uh, and I've, I have tried very hard you know, to, to understand what that means, and I, and I just don't think it's there. Um, you know, um, I think all scholarship is biased, so I think we ought, we ought to start there. And all scholarship is prejudiced. You know, by who we are, because none of us is possibly ideological, and I think attempts to, I think, to funnel us into a kind of, um, um, uh, 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 I think, a process in which, in which, in which we produce similar work uh, that is, that is, that is essentially, I think, um, I think, an, an inspiring and an, an interesting. I mean, I can just say here, you know, for a fact that, you know, Harold says that, um, you know. The journal, our journal here, uh, um, uh, you know, is readable. Um, I, I think I only partly agree with that. 
uh, I mean, at, at the risk of, of, of upsetting my my moderator here, but you know, but 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 I think that it, it is true that there are some very good pieces in, in the journal, uh, but I think there are other arcane pieces that I just don't understand why they are published. <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, and, and 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 I also think that there's an attempt, um, you know, I, I believe it's unconscious, uh, to suppress new voices in legal scholarship. Voices that might say something new to us. Um, I, I remember, for example, we were involved um, in, a, in a, a, a nascent movement to look at international law from a different perspective. We called it uh, various trail, third world approaches to international law. Uh, we called it NAIL, New Approaches to International Law. And I think there was reluctance to accept uh, what we were saying uh, and to publish what we were saying in this journal and other journals. Uh, and, and so I think that kind of bias is, 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 is what I'm calling the tyranny of, of the internet. Uh, finally, I just want to say that um, um, that um, that the notion of participation in running this society, you know, is going to determine what kind of end product we produce in this society. The notion of participation. I think we have to be very open-minded about, about, about inclusivity or inclusion in this society. I think we, we, we should start to think more or not, uh, we, we are an American society of international law, but I think we have to think uh, more in global terms. And I think that we have not made that turn. I think there is this sense that, um, that, um, that, that we hold, you know, that, 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 that we are a kind of a fountain, if you will, um, of knowledge. Uh, which I don't think we are. Uh, I think that one of the biggest things that is happening today, and Harold did not mention this, is just the rise of other powers around the globe. And their view of international law is going to be very important in uh, determining how we as a society evolve. You know, do we know, for example, what the Chinese international laws are thinking? Are we publishing them in our journals? And this is very important. Do we know what people are thinking in Brazil? You know, because I think that while the shift has taken place uh, at the level of the market, it has not, not, not taken place at the level of the intellect. And I think, uh, with all due respect to my colleagues in the society, I think we are behind the curve on this one. So I'll just leave my comments there. Thanks. Thanks. I, I think I want to uh, stay with this theme a little bit, uh, the theme of um, encouraging new voices and making sure that they are heard and finding uh, outlets which could be in the existing, the oldest uh, publications or they could be in the newest modalities. So I'd like to pass the microphone to Diane Ammon. Uh, among other things, I didn't mention in my introductory remarks about Professor Ammon that uh, she founded or co-founded, I founded, the um, Intel Girls Blog which uh, many of us read, and I think that's one way that um, new voices have been encouraged to speak and, uh, and are being heard. So maybe Diane would like to pick up on that, and then just take, take, uh, take your time on either the uh, opening gauntlet that Harold threw down or any other remarks that you'd like to. Which reminds me, Lori, that guest post. <laughs> when you retire, I think I shall have to remind you again. Um, thanks very much. Uh, in Law Girls is going to have its millionth page view uh, within the next two or three days if, if uh, the ticker continues to work. Um, I can't understand that at all. Uh, it was founded in February of 2007. I can't imagine a million people reading anything. Um, but apparently that happened. We have over a thousand readers a day. Um, I defy any of us to say with confidence that any of our law review articles have had that many readers. That, and, and if you look, we have a little map. And pretty much at any moment, there's someone on almost every continent reading it. So it's not an Ameri American-centered thing. I don't honestly know how that happened. I had an idea to start a blog. Um, I called it <coughs> Law Girls. Uh, double R GER because we were not happy with the state of affairs in the legal academy. Um, and one day I googled how to start a blog and within 10 minutes I had made one and it was live and I didn't even know how to, that happened or um, how to make it online. So there it was. And what's happened 
is um, it has become a platform for women of all ages, from uh, <coughs> law students to uh, people as senior as Judge Patricia Wald, as prominent as uh, newly elected prosecutor Fatu Ben Suda, um, to contribute things that they want to to a global audience um, in a thousand words or less. It is pretty serious for the most part. Uh, I had people decline to contribute initially because they felt it would harm their scholarly status, who later came back and said, hey, could I could contribute to that? Um, it suggests to me that the internet affects things in ways other than the breaking down of barriers, although we have felt that. We had a solidarity. We had a woman from Japan contribute yesterday uh, with places that we may never go to or people we may never actually meet. Um, but I, I will also say, if you go to Google Scholar, we've been cited in books already. We've been cited in law review articles. Um, Opinio Juris, which gets more readers, could say that probably double-fold. And so there's a form of contribution to the discourse in international law. I don't know that I would call it scholarship, although some of it is quite scholarly, that is not unimportant. And in some ways, if you figure out the ease of people tapping into something on the net, uh, may be reached by more people, particularly in the third world, and places where books and other <coughs> media are much harder to come by. Um, also, when you consider that you're, you're dealing with a Google keyword search, so they may not actually be visiting the blog, but may be looking for um, uh, something that was in the news today, and this is the first thing that comes up. Uh, I think that it has helped scholars. I know of at least one law student who was invited to speak to a conference or at a conference because of that. I know of one conference that looked at our list of contributors in order to shape its invitees. I know of two or three incidences, incidents where people turned their posts into op-eds that were published in mainstream media. Um, many people have used their posts as sort of the half-baked idea that eventually became a law review article. So there's something there that's not unimportant. Would I as a dean credit it for tenure? Honestly, I'm really old-fashioned, and I'm not sure that I would. I would put it in the category that I think is not unimportant in the days of U.S. News and World Report of uh, a desire, at least at the universities with which I've been affiliated, to have faculty be public intellectuals. And it is a way to be a public intellectual um, that gives a profile to the university, and I think that that goes into a tenure decision, even if it is not a check the box, this is half an article or something like that. Um, beyond that, let me say a couple of other things. Um, I spent break reading a few manuscripts, and um, there were a few things that sort of jumped out at me. My background is I have been a journalist since I was 15 years old. I have a bachelor's degree in journalism. I was editor-in-chief of my um, very large million-dollar budget college newspaper. Uh, I then became a graduate school student, had to learn a different way of, teach, of, of writing, and then I became a law student, had to learn a different way of writing for exams. I was a practitioner for six years. I wrote many, many briefs at all levels of uh, the American justice system, and then came to the law review uh, format that we have as law professors. I strongly believe that no one should put a finger to a keyboard without knowing the audience for which they're writing. And I very seldom see that apparent in manuscripts that I read. Um, there is a shifting of persons from I to we to they to you, which to me is suggestive of not really knowing who it is you're aiming for. There is a jumping back and forth to very high levels of jargon, words like intersubjective and reify, and all of those words, some of which have meaning, some of which don't. Um, and then back down to contractions bordering on eight in the same article. Um, 
And it seems to me that one thing that we should do is think about what am I writing here? A blog post is supposed to be breezy. A treatise is not. And there's a lot of things in between. If you're writing an amicus brief, you're writing for a judge who probably never took international law. That's going to require a different level of explication than for a specialty journal where all readers will have, will consider themselves experts in the area. And I think that our scholarship would be improved immensely if we would just stop and think about that a little bit as we write. Um, I think I'll stop there. I had some other thoughts, but they'll come up in the course of the discourse. Professor Bradley. Um, maybe if you could revert maybe back to some of um, Harold Coe's opening remarks and uh, give us your reflections on those and uh, pick up on this, uh, you know, the audience question as, as you want. Absolutely sure. Um, each of us obviously has our own perspective based on what we've been doing. Uh, I come at this a little bit, uh, I've been teaching for about 16 years or so, and have had at least at times a voice that's sometimes described as more critical of kind of some mainstream thinking in international law, and particularly in U.S. foreign relations law. Um, I can, and I'll try to address some of the incentive structure questions that Harold mentioned in a couple of minutes, uh, maybe touch on a couple of other points that have been raised. But my experience, which may not be shared by everybody, and is, a, is an overgeneralization, but is my experience, was when I started teaching, um, international law was perceived of, by me, but I think a lot of other people who were not in international law, of having certain kinds of characteristics that were not positive. Uh, now, obviously, with many exceptions, but one is too advocacy-oriented as a class, um, too, too normative, too advocacy-pitched, uh, too insular. Uh, that means talking only within the body of international law. Groupies using highly specialized language, um, you know, our use cogens is better than your use cogens, and nobody understands what you're talking about. Um, and not, and often sometimes even a substitute for actual engagement and analysis, in, at least in ways that would convince anybody outside your community. Um, relatedly, a failure often to, to actually sharply distinguish between aspirations about how one would like to see the world and how it's actually working and how legal actors actually make decisions. Um, and I think all of that related uh, to a kind of defensive quality that international law scholars, uh, to some degree, uh, uh, saw themselves as part of a community under siege. The public didn't think much of international law, the argument would go, politicians never seemed to take it that seriously, other colleagues didn't think there was really that much law there, and so as part of our communitarian bonds, we tell, keep talking to each other about how we're true believers, and so we re remind ourselves that there's really something important here. And that might be an important community bonding experience, but it is not conducive to great rigorous scholarship. And there was a quality that I think, uh, no, with many exceptions, that was uh, that, that, that describes. Having said that, I, Harold mentioned two cheers for the modern international scholarship, and I completely endorse what he said. I have seen in the last uh, 15 years significant changes in what I just described. So, and Harold mentioned some of it. Uh, much more interdisciplinary, uh, including a lot more engagement or co-authorship with political scientists, um, economists, uh, historians, um, much richer uh, kind of dialogues that go beyond this kind of specialized insular discourse. And there are all sorts of ways, and we can talk about ways in, to keep promoting that. Um, much more ideologically diverse than when I started teaching. Um, not sure exactly all the reasons for that phenomenon. Um, you know, in general, the, the, the legal academy is fairly liberal and progressive. There are all sorts of reasons why that, ten that, that tends to be attractive to people of that mindset in academia. But international law in particular seemed to have a character that was not, didn't have a lot of diversity of kind of thinking about uh, these issues, and that is not true anymore. And I give great credit to the American Society of International Law for being a big tent in the last 15 years or so, bringing in a lot of voices. Uh, just to give an example from today, uh, some of you I know were at this, a uh, debate co-sponsored with the Federal Society and, uh, and the American Society about the Alien Tort Statute, uh, two different kinds of perspectives on that, and the, society, the American Society is very much involved in setting that up. Um, so in much, I agree with the two cheers, I think it's better, it's not perfect, but uh, I, would, I just want to appreciate that we've come uh, some good distance. Um, is the incentive structure great uh, for scholarship? Um, there are problems with it. Now some of the problems that Harold mentions are very similar to the problems we've had for a while. Uh, they're not unique to international law scholarship. Uh, some of you may remember Judge Harry Edwards many years ago, actually when I, about the time I started teaching, maybe 20 years ago, was complaining 
you know, the academics were no longer speaking in ways that were practical to the judges, in particular, is what he had in mind. I've heard that many, from many judges, including a lot of judges I teach. And certainly that's true. Uh, the, the academy, with more PhDs, more interdisciplinary work of the type I just mentioned, seems somewhat more removed from the day-to-day -day practice of the law, at least to some people's eyes, the less doctrinal it becomes. Now, there are positive, many positives with that, which is that it tends to be less normative. It tends to be uh, thinking outside the box in ways that I think it didn't in the past. But the people who want to consume this and use it in practice are probably more concerned that it's not as useful to them as at least they think it might have been in the, in the past. So it's not entirely a new criticism. It's not really unique to international law. Uh, my own perspective is, I think, if, if there ought to be a diversity of scholarship. That is, the, I think there's a great room for the very high-level theoretical perspectives that primarily, if they move things, they move people's thinking very broadly about law and legal theory, don't really help the judges or the legal advisor's office very much, but hopefully people who have had government experience and know what some of the difficult real issues are are also engaging with those on a faculty, and deans obviously ought to reward both. What are the bad incentives? Uh, People are, have incentives to write too much. That's one of the bad incentives. It's not true about just about international law. Um, and that means you write too quickly. You don't write as stuff that's as good as it could be. Uh, you want to have a big tenure file. You're competing nowadays with PhD candidates that farm out all the chapters of the dissertation into articles. And they come in as entry levels with five articles or more. And uh, they haven't even come close to tenure. So something needs to, the deans need to be thinking about that. Uh, there's a great value in the historical projects or empirical projects. It may take years to really bring to a uh, to successful completion. I think deans are hopefully uh, sensitive to the different kinds of projects that scholars engage in, but there's still some kind of felt pressure, I know, on younger people, uh, junior faculty, to put out a lot of articles where you know they're only 80% finished. And I just see that all too often, I, and I think we ought to try to combat that. Uh, related, and Harold, I think, touched on this. Um, there is too much reward given for the strong normative claim that's probably wrong, but at least everybody gets excited about it. And that's because everybody's going to talk about it, and it means that you're on the map, and you get noticed, and particularly junior faculty care a lot about uh, this. Um, and less, uh, unfortunately, reward sometimes for the really thoughtful, rigorous framework pieces that doesn't actually care that much about the bottom line, but guides everybody through those difficult trenches of analysis we ought to find ways to reward the latter, uh, maybe even more than these exciting uh, new theories that never, no one's ever going to accept, but it's very exciting. And not that, I don't think that we ought to not have those other things. Uh, having stupid theories sometimes is great for scholarship, because then everybody figures out what really isn't stupid, and they counteract it with great, uh, with great uh, alternative articles. And it can stir things up, but that should not be the only uh, model. A couple of other thoughts in response to other comments. Um, I, I, by definition, I must believe in peer review. I'm on the board of editors uh, of the journal, American Journal of International Law, and I am a believer in the values of it. Um, there are dangers of peer review, uh, and, and one has to be aware of it and thinking about it in a journal like the American Journal. And one is the danger, uh, sort of, Adim uh, Matua talked about this, that, that there's a group perspective on things that will not be as conducive to new thinking. And, it, and one, one effect of that is to flatten out scholarship so that you, you may find perfectly acceptable kind of, you know, um, you know mid-level articles getting regularly published that aren't that exciting, but they're fine. Um, and the super exciting might be wrong, but might be right, kind of uh, change the world article, never going to get published in some of these uh, kind of peer-reviewed systems where it has to be acceptable to kind of a very uh, standard mid-level kind of community. And, you know, uh, student-edited journals have all sorts of problems. Uh, sometimes they almost seem random in their selection. But one good thing about random is sometimes you hit really interesting targets. Um, and the student edited process sometimes actually publishes uh, some of the most interesting uh, international law scholars. Uh, not that I think they did it on purpose, but they, uh, they happen to have that effect in ways that sometimes you're not going to see otherwise. Um, uh, Diane mentioned blogging. And, um, and maybe we'll have time to talk about more generally kind of other activities of blog professors. I have lots of views about that. I struggle with myself. On, on the blogging, I have really agonized about this. Um, maybe because I just agonize about everything. Uh, that I'm a terrible blogger, I find, because I am more, it literally takes me like a full day to post the three paragraphs on a blog. If you like me, don't do it. Because, I mean, that's a full day. It's going to, I could really be adding to that article I'm working on. 
And I'm so worried that I'll write something uh, after a day's reflection that is just not going to be what I would have said after six months or a year's reflection. So I don't want to, if I blog, I don't want to blog about anything I'm going to write about because it's just embarrassing to say, people say, well, you, you said the opposite actually six months ago. And I think there's a high danger that I would do that. And, and, the, and the worry I have is a little bit like op-ed writing, which, and, uh, which I have the same problem with, which is it might also encourage me to kind of just throw out ideas a little too quickly. And I worry, you know, this relates to more advocacy activities. I worry that we're not so good as we think we are just changing hats. Oh, I had my blog hat on this morning. I have my scholarship hat on this afternoon. Tonight I'll have my brief writing hat. I don't know. I'm not that good at that, actually. I worry that hat is still on somehow from this morning. And so I think there's just something we need to be aware of that all these different kinds of writing activities may not be neatly separable. And as I said, one of the problems I thought with international law scholarship when I started teaching was it was too advocacy oriented. And I do worry that some of these activities, maybe not blogging so much, but certainly writing all these briefs that I see, will tend to encourage this culture of staking out too strongly anticipating positions that are not nuanced, that don't have qualifications you should put in your articles. And there would be a sort of a habit of mind that might not be great for the other kinds of work. But that would be my worry. Yeah, I, I actually was going to just pick up on that last point and sort of uh, turn to the role shift that a scholar might go through, scholar as advocate in a uh, very public way, and then uh, also pick up on some of the things that uh, uh, Dean Matua had um, uh, asked us to think about before when he was talking about the scholar as a shaper of minds, as a, as a, a you know, a, a, a participant in a consciousness raising process. But uh, if you want to jump in, that's fine. Yeah, two specific things. Two specific things. Um, I think part of what I'm hearing you say is people need to be true to themselves. And maybe this is where there's a disconnect with incentivization. Um, some people are great bloggers. Some people are great law review writers. Some people are great poets. They, may, they seldom are all the same person. And the problem, perhaps, with the structure today, and I think it's not only top down from deans, but I know at Cal Davis what I saw was the juniors created um, so much scholarship that the senior faculty's expectations changed without our standards having been changed. Because, uh, and this may be something, there are only a few law schools that produce most of the law professors at the junior level, and they're very, very competitive. And so it wasn't Davis that started looking for lots of publications before hire. It was the po applicant pools we were seeing that made anyone who didn't have it look inadequate. And I, we saw that as people were coming up through tenure. Every year, the tenure files would be richer and richer without us actually having requested that. Um, I think people are waiting. Many people are writing far too much. Um, sometimes the same thing, quite honestly. Um, and one of the things I'm not seeing, and this was something I felt very deeply in the immediate post-9-11 era, but as I move into more uh, laws of war from a, a structural sense and other things, I've been reading the American Journal from 1945 to 1950. I suspect many people writing on uh, the United Nations and the post-war uh, security structure, international structure, have never done that. And so they're sort of surmising from a read-through of the chapter what they must have meant without reading kind of the legislative history, if you will, of that period. I'm not an originalist, but I don't think you can actually understand a norm without yourself grappling, really from the very first word to the last word, not wikipedia it, not Googling it for the one snippet. And I don't think a lot of us are doing that. And I think part of it is we all feel or impress upon ourselves a pressure to do more and more and more and more. And, and the, the tenure tracks shortening and this idea of more publications just fuels that cycle. Thanks. Um, well, I want to take us, want to take us back to this question of um, the scholar as activist or the scholar as advocate. We've heard some uh, critical remarks about that phenomenon. Um, we've also heard that it's inevitable or to be encouraged. Um, some of us have written some amicus briefs in our time as scholars. Uh, they might even have been cited in the dissent or maybe in the majority opinion to be um, 
I'm dissed. And um, so we could tell our, our war stories. But um, I think it would be interesting to hear from the panel uh, their reflections on uh, the scholar activist. Uh, let me say, you know, each of these modes of scholarship has the virtue of its vices, you know. So interdisciplinary devalues law. Uh, empirical tries to measure stuff you can count, you know. When, when you can't measure what's important, you make important what you can measure. Um, you know, advocacy scholarship may not be as balanced. Critical scholarship is more interested in showing what's wrong with the status quo than in generating plausible alternatives. Um, I actually think advocacy scholarship, by and large, along with blogging, has been a positive trend um, because Frankly, international legal scholarship has become so irrelevant um, that in, in the same way as the constitutional jurisprudence uh, of the, the Warren Court and the debate over the civil rights movement generated extraordinary amount of scholarship on this issue, you know, Charles Black or, or Herb Wexler or whatever, it galvanized a generation and then uh, the next generation, which was responding to the Berger Court, started developing theories of judicial review, uh, you know, John Hart Ely, uh, Jesse Chopper, folks like this, that made the scholarship suddenly much more relevant to what was going on in the real world. And I think that the um, debates over law, human rights, national security, generated a tremendous amount of uh, robust debate that I think in some ways started out being very polarized and now is increasingly asymptotically um, you know, merging toward some, you know, some sets of agreements. Um, and, and so I think actually, and also, by the way, um, at least it's there. Um, you know, I, I clerked, um, you know, judges know how to ignore amicus briefs. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're not, they know when an amicus brief was written by one person and signed by 10 others. And when you look at the footnotes and see that all the people cited are those who signed the brief, you know what that means. <laughs> so, you know, um, more debate, more dialogue on the advocacy side can be just discounted. Um, what I think is harder in all of this is um, knowing the difference between what is actually uh, rigorous, thoughtful, good, um, and, and not. And I'll tell you, um, very, very few appointments committees really have good judgment. Very few people really read. Uh, very few people really know their fields. Um, the tenure files at one school are usually good enough to get into another because one thing you can do is count pages. And um, I do think that um, uh, uh, there's much less discussion in faculty meetings about uh, who's doing important work and how it fits into uh, uh, the evolution of a field or why it's important. You know, many people delegate the faculty responsibilities to appointments committee who writes reports and then at those schools that, you know, the people come back from their consulting and bless the outcome and someone gets appointed or not. And then also, what I find the most, it, it's worse than Congress and congressional staffers. People repeat things that they heard from third or fourth party hearsay as the view not because I actually read it or made independent analysis, but because they have to have an opinion, might as well trade in other people's opinions. And in academia, this is uh, as bad as I've ever seen. Um, you know, someone's great, and then the next day they're terrible, and it's because some opinion maker who heard from someone else tells you, and then suddenly, you know, you know, a lot of stuff that was good is suddenly not so good because somebody thinks they've pointed to some Achilles heel. Um, so I think that, that we just have to be honest about it and create forums where you know, genuine analysis, genuine discussion, genuine debate is going on, where people understand much more clearly what the stakes are. Um, and you know, I think a constructive project from this kind of conversation is what kind of apparatuses might work. I, I think young scholars meeting with each other and just furiously questioning each other about the value of their work 
is a fantastic development. Because when I was a young scholar in the ASIL, we were all interested in pleasing our elders, <coughs> uh, as opposed to persuading our colleagues why what we were doing was worthwhile. And I, I think a, a sense of collective identity among the younger scholars, without regard to ideology or methodology, would be very helpful. And that's where I think the society has been doing a great job. Yeah, thank you. So I, I just want to think a little bit about um, um, you know, the kind of world in which we are operating today. Um, we have, in the past um, several years, been hit with major cuts to, to higher education. Uh, defunding uh, of higher education where public uh, schools are concerned, and I think uh, shrinking endowments and uh, collections uh, for private schools. Um, I think the consequence of that is we have to think as you know, uh, educators about um, how to invest what we have and invest it you know, wisely. Um, and for, for my part, I think one of the things I've thought about uh, is um, the responsibility of the scholar as a citizen. Uh, you know, I don't believe that we can any longer just uh, take the view that uh, this Carla is an irresponsible actor, you know, who is simply fascinated by ideas which have no end for social purpose. Um, it, this is not to say that, um, you, know, um, you know, I don't recognize the value of uh, just pure seduction by ideas. Um, I do. Um, but I think it harkens back to an earlier, uh, you know, my earlier life as a person who worked in, uh, in an NGO, um, in which I saw myself as a participant in social transformation, and in which I wanted to carry, the only way I could go to the academy, I thought, was if I felt that I was going to go do something there that would continue that project. Um, and so I think as, 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 as resources kind of you know, dwindle, you know, we have to make choices. And we have to make socially relevant choices. Um, I think we are some of the highest paid people um, uh, in the United States. I mean, if you look at what we make, and then you think about what we have to do for it, <laughs> it's almost laughable. I mean, uh, many law schools are now have gone out of three courses, as you all know. And that translates roughly into uh, maybe two major courses in, in, in a seminar. That is nothing. It's a working uh, In terms of the scholarly pro productivity, you know, you, you, you have Dean will pat you on the head if you produce one good art per year. Well, that's nothing. You know, so my view is that if I'm going to invest in. Um, in incentivizing, you know, uh, you know, scholarship, uh, you know, for a political class, um, you know, because I think we're a political class that is interested in what's going on. Uh, I think I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, err towards, uh, you know, uh, you know, incentivizing scholarship that I that I believe is relevant, uh, socially encouraging that scholarship that is relevant. And, uh, and, and pushing people to become public intellectuals as well, because I think that's important. Uh, because there's no one else to do it in a society. I think we are, we, are, we, are, we are the people who are best placed to do it. And as deans, I think we have to incentivize that. Um, you know, so, so I think just to, um, you know, to, to there's, a, there's, a, there's a pejorative, I think, view of the scholar activist, and has been such a view for a long, long time. And I think Harold, the one of the few uh, people, I think, who uh, you know did both. Uh, you are a scholar and you are an activist uh, in in very commendable ways. Um, you know, and, and and so so I think we can we can we can incentivize this. And, and I, I, I see that um, um, uh, you know that um, one of the problems is is also what is expected of pre-tenure faculty. And this 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 was talked about earlier today. Um, and I just want to make one point about that. In, our, in the structure of legal education, most law schools tenure at full after six years. Um, 
most other disciplines tenure at associate after seven years or six years. And you are lucky to become a full professor after 14 years. Okay? So what we are trying to do is to cram together in our field what others are doing in 14 years. And so we are asking our junior faculty members to simply you know, uh, beat themselves to death to produce this kind of work. And that's, that's where I think it's coming from. And I think even in terms of, um, you know, uh, they have no time to be, to, to be scholar activists. They just don't. Because to be a good scholar activist, it, you know, it means that you must at least have some sense of what is going on in the practical world. When are you going to do that and produce, you know, or ten articles uh, in addition to the five that you had before you were hired? You know, how are you going to be able to do that? So I think that we have to think as deep much more seriously and kind of ratchet back on how many articles we will require, you know, for part of the dossier for ten. You know, perhaps, um, you know, I, I remember the early times where I think two articles were sufficient. Two good articles uh, were sufficient. You know, so I just put that out there for discussion. Very soon we're going to open the floor so that you all can ask some questions. But before you do, I have just one other um, theme to put to the panel. It's been alluded to in some of their remarks already. I think uh, Harold referred to it as the Americano-centric nature of uh, scholarship, and uh, uh, Dean Matua had also uh, made some reference to um, um, a lack of rep receptivity to hearing the voices from other parts of the world. So I guess the general question that I want to put to the panel is, are we equipping our students well enough to practice international law in a globalized world? How can we be doing that better, or how can our scholarship be oriented in a way that will uh, allow us to be integrating into the scholarship published in this country um, the developments that are occurring outside the United States. So if we can have a few thoughts on that and then we'll open it up for your questions. I think we all need to learn at least one language other than our birth language. And if you haven't started now, you've got a lot of time <laughs> to do it. Um, and I think we need to read in that language. We need to visit the country and interact with the scholars there. Um, I don't think, for instance, you could talk about sovereignty without engaging with the European project, where they've been thinking about sovereignty very deeply for the last 50 years and have an incredibly rich literature and experience in it. Um, to talk about it without thinking about their views of so sovereignty, uh, it, it's half an article. Um, every time I do a conference outside the United States where I tend to be the only American, or one of very few, um, I learn very much. And I learn how America is seen in ways that uh, would not come about if we brought that person here. I've, I've talked to colleagues in France that were invited to, actually Colombia was one of them, post 9-11 to talk about their perspective. And this colleague who's extreme, probably one of the most prominent uh, French legal academics said, I was ignored. And I was essentially told, this is an American problem, your experience is not interesting. Um, that's going to happen when you have that dynamic. But going elsewhere and just sitting and listening, I listened to uh, a conference at The Hague where I was the only American in November, and all they wanted to talk about was the Libya intervention. It's a very different discussion than I think you would have had in Tiller House with those of us who are here today. So I think it's really hard to call yourself an international lawyer if you don't attempt to broach the rest of the world as best you can. I'll give an anecdote just because uh, you just reminded me one at time. Um, I'm not sure this will advance the discussion, but I'll make it short. Uh, so I was in China about a year ago at Wuhan giving a, one of their named lectures, and um, one of the talks, they, they definitely want you to do a lot when you go there, and I had many named talks, but I was giving one about, it's difficult to explain, the U.S. relationship with human rights treaties over the years from the Bricker Amendment days on. 
And they, always, they also want you to speak for like an hour before they interrupt you. And so I spoke. I thought it was going well. They, they were very attentive, which was great. And it was packed audience. And so I finished finally after about an hour. And first hand goes up. And they said, thank you, Professor Bradley. I really enjoyed that. Could you now explain why the America starts all the wars in the world? Thank you. <laughs> How do you answer? <laughs> so I agree. It's good to go over. <laughs> okay. Okay. I would say that on this, I think that in many ways, the opportunities for travel, both by students and by faculty, in what is a shrinking world, may solve this issue as opposed to sticking it into the three-year curriculum, um, which I think has gotten a lot more packed uh, and in which there's less clear canon than there was. So, I mean, for example, to have an American or American-trained person explaining Chinese law as opposed to going to China and studying in China, it may not make as much sense. Uh, but I do think that international law professors should practice international law. When, when I was a kid, uh, someone said to me, those who can't do, teach. And I was so offended by that. Uh, it happened when I was pretty young. And my father was a teacher. And I knew he was a great practitioner. And I just decided I never want, wanted that to be said. I just thought, but the truth of it is, many international law scholars can't practice or when they appear in the international legal settings, they're ineffective or um, counterproductive and um, don't have a sense of how international law plays into decision making. Um, and I think that that's something that, it, and, and frankly, one reason I got into advocacy, human rights advocacy, after I got tenure was because I felt that there were many things I just didn't know how to do well enough. And I, you know, that's a good time. Right after you got tenure, they can't kick you out. <laughs> you might as well make yourself really able to do these things so that you have credibility with international lawyers and not just with other professors. So um, for those of you who have just gotten tenure and who are thinking now about should I be associate dean of my school or all the other stuff they're about to dump on you, say, I want to leave so I can go and live in a foreign country and actually understand their approach to international law in a way that makes me so much better at what I do. Um, and fight for that. Tell your dean I need some money. <laughs> yeah, I'll yeah, just good luck with that. I'll just, uh, <laughs> um, I'll just uh, you know, I think there's an elephant, um, you know, in the room whenever we talk about, uh, you know, the nature of American legal education today. Um, you know, I think we may have to rethink the JD program. Very radical. Um, the JD program, um, you know, is something that um, is over 100 years old. And I think uh, was constructed for another era. And I think we, 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 are, we are kind of um, uh, entering a kind of a territory um, in terms of um, uh, both uh, you know, the nature of the globe that, uh, that Harold and others are talking about, uh, but also the nature of legal practice. That I think is going to require that we rethink our curriculum in radical ways that I know faculties are loath to touch. You know, um, I think we appear to be wedded to a three-year program, uh, just to start with. And uh, you know, I, I like men, You know, sometimes and, and I, I wake up in the middle of the night thinking, you know, is three years enough, um, or is it too much? Uh, you know, and 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 uh, depending upon the longevity of, of that program, what should we be doing within that program? You know, we have a problem with of the ABA. The ABA is um, uh, are regulated, essentially. And they won't even and allow us to open you know, branches of our law schools abroad. They won't permit that today. You know, um, so I think that relationship between, between law schools and the ABA ought to be rethought. Because I think they have too much power uh, in, in, in how we think about the JD program. But I think fundamentally faculties may have to start to think much more seriously about the JD program 
and how, you know, it, it, it seems to me that it is not responding to, to what is happening today. So, for example, Diane says that we should uh, learn a second language. Well, is that something that we should offer in law school? You know, that's one of the questions. You know, should we offer Chinese in law schools or, you know, or some other language? So I just put these things out there for discussion. Well, I think we have about 20 minutes. Still, Betsy, is that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, we'd like to get your questions or your observations. Uh, Gary, Harley. Uh, I like Harold's idea. We love our practical ship students offshore and try and put courses in your law school. Do you want to ask We're we're going to send you a microphone. Just a second. <laughs> I like Harold's idea because it's easier to ship students. An innocent sounding question, I'm actually asking it innocently. Are there any numbers on how many law students go overseas for at least a semester? The number for undergraduates that I've seen is 4%, which is not really encouraging. I, I know some colleges do 40, 50 percent. Nationally, it's 4%. Um, I haven't seen those numbers, but I, I think it's more than that. But, my response to Macau, I hear what Macau is saying. I just think that um, we don't have to put everything into three years. I mean, my, my brother's a doctor. Uh, he did four years of medical school, and when he graduated, they called him a doctor. And he came back, and I said, congratulations, doctor. And he said, I'm not a doctor. I have a degree, MD. There's another eight to 10 years in which I'm going to do fellowships, uh, or, or specialties, take a million boards and stuff. And at the end, I'll be a doctor. So guess what? Law school is the same. Um, you graduate from law school and you're you know, somewhere between 25 and 35 most of the time. Now, with people's long lives, you have many, many more years. And you can even practice at a firm, make partner, retire, and then have a good long run ahead of you to do other things. So I think that people should just do more things. You know, every time I go into the government, I think, well, that's a book I'm not writing, you know. Um, who's to say the world is worse off? <laughs> and I'm certainly better off. So I, 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 I think that um, uh, there is some tendency to want to get settled and established and get everything done and then get onto your track. But as those of us who do this for a long time know, you know, every... 10 years or so, it's good to do something a little different. You come back, you're a better teacher, you're a better scholar. And um, I think the same goes for students. I think that this, the, the law students should get these range of experiences over a period which they would consider to be, um, you know, uh, five to 10 years from the day they start law school. David Sloss. Hi, I guess I'll stand up too. Uh, I, I want to offer a comment in response to the last comment and to some of the comments at the end. But So uh, at Santa Clara, I run a center for international law, and we uh, do uh, summer abroad programs for US law students. And we have more summer abroad programs than any other school in the country, and we're sending more students overseas for foreign study than any other uh, school in the country by far. So last summer, we put about 200 students in summer programs overseas, and about 100 of them uh, we had them doing internships overseas, which I think is actually a great thing for them to get experience. But, but one of the things that strikes me that I think is very odd is almost everybody who's attending our programs is coming from lower tier law schools. And this is not just our programs, it's other summer abroad programs too. Very few students from like top 20 law schools are doing these summer abroad programs, or doing these overseas experiences. And there's a disconnect here, because they're the students who are actually going to get out there and do international law practice. I mean, we don't have a lot of students from Santa Clara who are going into an international law practice. There are a lot more from the top end law schools who can go off and do it. But the top end law schools are not giving students these opportunities, or they're not taking advantage of them, to go spend time studying and working and practicing overseas while they're in law school. So, it seems to me there's a problem here with the way this is structured, and I'm not quite sure what to do about it, but I think it's something worth uh, thinking about. So I'll just offer that as a comment. Well, 
Well, I, I think um, the, the question is whether that's empirically true or not, because it may well be that people that go to elite schools did all that in middle school. Um, and there may be something to be said for having programs where people uh, who may be the first person to graduate from college and the first time they figure out how to get enough money together to do a summer program is law school to have that available. But I think the larger thing is that the more experience you get abroad, the better the message that it's a good thing to do. And, you know, I, I, I think I went to a panel once where they said, that, do they actually learn anything? Or is this just tourism? And, and the answer was, tourism is not a bad thing. And, and I know when I did a study abroad program, maybe the second time I'd ever been in an airplane in my life, the thing that struck me the most was that currency was different. And for some re reason, for me, that opened the door to realizing that people thought in very different ways, that, that they did not transact uh, business with the same set of ideas. And so for me, that was a, probably a bigger insight than the 15 weeks on uh, European integration that went on during the study abroad program. Um, so I think it's a good thing. I would also say, and I think this may be part of what I heard Harold say, um, there is an opportunity in this economy to encourage students to do LLMs and advanced degrees. They got nothing else better to do and it seems to me, if the JD program is packed, uh, you know, particularly if you're in a place where they're, they're very um, compulsive about getting bar courses in or stuff, there's not a lot left by the time they've done that. Um, but they don't have a job. And it seems to me that the LLM is a way to maybe um, give them a twofer of that experience abroad and also a credential that begins to set them apart from other people in the market. Yeah. I you know, I think I, I think there's something to be said for the study abroad programs. Um, you know, but my feeling has been for a long time that that these programs could also be junkets. Uh, you know, uh, I know that some schools, for example, you know, send students abroad, but then there's an American law professor to go teach them there. Now that defeats the whole purpose. I mean, that makes no, no sense to me. So. Um, and, and, and certainly, you know, and there's a feeling also that, uh, that, that we, can, we can actually address the problem that we're talking about by, you know, exposing people, you know, you know to a foreign country for three months. You know, I, and I think that's, that's a mistake. Um, I mean, what I would like to see is a more involved uh, program whereby students can go abroad for a full year as part of their legal education. That is enough time, I think, to get something going, um, you know, and, and to begin to transform or to change your mindset, because I think mean, that's what it's going to take, uh, ultimately. I think we, today, American lawyers are competing with, um, with Chinese lawyers, with uh, lawyers from Brazil. It is no longer the case where American law firms had to run on the place. That is no longer the case. And how are the lawyers that we produce today going to compete with those other lawyers from most of the societies. You know, they don't need to hire American lawyers anymore in Brazil because they have their own lawyers who can do the work. And that's what we have to, you know, to confront with in asking the question as to whether our JD program is doing the job. I'll, I'll add one thing as well. Um, partly because I see one of my students in the audience, so it sort of reminds me. Um, one thing I do like that we have, that Duke and it speaks to this a little bit, um, although I wish the numbers were a little bit higher, but about 15% of all of our JD students uh, American JD students uh, take uh, the JD LLM program that we have, and the LLM is in international and comparative law, and they are all required actually to spend uh, the first summer after the first year of law school abroad in one of our either Geneva or Hong Kong. Most of them also work part of that summer in Tokyo or Europe, uh, depending on which program they're in, and they're required to do this as part of their experience. And I was a little worried. I actually went to talk in Hong Kong recently. As part of this, I was worried to be kind of a junket. Uh, you know, they're just going to have fun. And I was very pleasantly surprised it was not, at least in this program, anything like that. And in fact, going into the Hong Kong program, what I found was they're sitting there with half Chinese students, half American students. The American students, uh, the Chinese students were working extremely hard. The American students did not want to be showed up by their Chinese counterparts. So they found that they really worked hard in the class to make sure that the Chinese impression was not of Americans kind of taking it uh, not seriously enough. And I, I thought that was great. And you know, I, you know, they also got exposed to lots of interesting perspectives. So, 
just give you one example. Everybody knows in the war on terror cases, Boumedi and in these cases. So uh, the, in the course of structure, it's half of it by an American professor and the other half by some non-American professor to give different perspectives. So I was talking about those cases, and the Chinese student said, this is just you know, amazing. Why didn't President Bush go to the Supreme Court before the decisions and, and try to save face by working it out? <laughs> it was a great question for them. It was really good for the American students to hear a different perspective about how you might, might not want a judicial system like that, but it was interesting that somebody would have that question. Or you might. Or you might. <laughs> okay, uh, yes, uh, Bob Lutz. I'm wondering, uh, Harold, if the, same, if the same criticism might be made by the legal advisor to the French foreign ministry. <laughs> of uh, French scholarship or German scholarship uh, is, uh, there were some comments about the international scholarship issue, but uh, scholarship is really di very differently being produced in different countries, and I think it's an interesting perspective that we really haven't appreciated in terms of, uh, of uh, what's happening in the world. The comments made were largely American-centric. So, um, one of the most interesting things to to do is both from a academic perspective and from a government perspective. You know, the, the international law communities, uh, even of other large and influential countries, are quite small, and they are very hierarchical. Um, you know. I can tell you now who will be the ICJ nominee from a particular country because they have, you know, a pecking order and a food chain and people work their way up the food chain and, uh, you know, are designated for those purposes. In the United States, it's a much more uh, open situation and, and the extent to which there is a community of international law is much more in a society like this. I mean, we, we don't just go to... Uh, the Oxford or Cambridge professor of international law and ask them do they want to be on the International Law Commission. And so I think that um, there's also a sense of the science and the law, the law practice as sort of being somewhat connected. So to take his name in vain, Daniel Bethlehem, who was a scholar of international law, but then uh, became the legal advisor of the Foreign Office in the UK is now very much a kind of American style, to my mind, legal realist. While others in his old office continue very much in a British style of international law, which is, um, has a much more constrained view of what the role of a lawyer is in making political decisions. So um, I think we have something pretty special here. Uh, not that I don't like these other countries or would turn down invitations to go and speak at <laughs> those universities. Um, but I, I think that um, the craziness and wild diversity of, of uh, American life and all of the fervor and ferment. So, you know, Macau started, I think, correctly by pointing out the many ways in which this is a very exclusive society. But, you know, look at us here, Barack Obama's president. Uh, it didn't look like that. Uh, back in the old days when Laurie and I were, were, were young. <laughs> Okay, we, we do have, yes, in the back. Yes, please. Sonia Roland, University. Uh, my question also goes to the uh, American Center versus you know, more of a worldwide uh, approach to uh, teaching international law. Uh, I was trained in France before I came to the U.S. and walked into the first international law class uh, in my JD program here and thought I got the room wrong. Um, and uh, then I started teaching, and I looked at casebooks, and I found that, well, that's where a lot of the American-centered approach seemed to come from. And I think there's a real dilemma here. Do we, do we teach, do we, for the casebook authors, right, um, do they design casebooks for uh, American <coughs> lawyers, or future American lawyers who might one day make an argument to an American judge, in which case you've had a lot of constitutional cases and so forth? Or do you prepare casebooks for uh, students, future lawyers who might make arguments in international fora, and the case would be very differently. Um, so, if there's some thoughts uh, here from the office, I think we can hear them. Let me just say that um, 
Who cares about case books? And, and I'm a co-author of a number of them. <laughs> um, and we buy ours. Uh, but, but look, you know, we live in an age where the internet and uh, websites and um, Blackboard and all these things, nobody has to use the materials that somebody else prepared unless you're too uh, uh, unwilling to go out and develop a set of materials that suit your own purposes. And you can assign a book just to make the students feel good about having a book. But, you know, we're now in an age where you don't even have to have a syllabus. You know, <laughs> you can tell them look on the website tomorrow for the class next week. You know, I, I remember my first year of teaching, we had to prepare all the course materials uh, a month before the first day of class so that it could get Xeroxed <laughs> properly, you know? And the great thing about now is everybody can, just like everybody can publish, everybody can make their own case book. And so I, I think that um, you, and plus they still send you those things for free. So I would, I would just, um, if you don't like what's there, you know, just use whatever bit of it is useful to you and then design your own thing and then share it with others. Uh, because I think when people start to see that what you've got is useful, they'll shift to yours. I mean, that, that's the story of casebooks, as Kurt knows, is, is you get everybody who's sick of the old casebook, and then you design your casebook, then, then they get sick of yours, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what Harold has said, but I, I also thought that perhaps you, you were implying um, that the case method is a problem. Is that, was that part of your question? Yeah, because I think, um, you know, I think so, you know, when you teach international law, for example, one of the questions that you always have to ask yourself is, do you teach international law um, as adjudicated uh, through American courts, or do you teach international law as adjudicated, um, you know, because law comes alive in the common law system, in the courts, do you teach, do you teach it as adjudicated to international tribunals? And that's, that's an important distinction, and I've always found myself uh, attracted to case books that had plenty of, uh, you know, case law from international tribunals as opposed to just you know, uh, you know a court. That said, I, I think there's, there's something important in what you said, which is that if you were not trained in France beforehand, you wouldn't know where to find that information. I mean, if you look, for instance, at the, the UK decisions in the Pinochet case on immunity, and then you look at a decision of the Cour de Cassation in, um, I believe, a Lockerbie immunity case. The, the French decision is about one page, and it begins with the word whereas all the way through. There is value in, in putting those both in a book, not even as much for the proposition of law, but again, to get people understanding there are different ways to reason through this. And our case books don't do that. And to the extent that they don't do that, people who were not fortunate enough to have been trained elsewhere really don't know where to begin to find that kind of information. So maybe you're putting down a, a gauntlet for casebook authors who claim to be doing international law to think a bit more deeply about what materials they're putting in there. Betsy, do we have time for one more question? We're kind of at the end. Kind of at the end. Oh. Okay. Well, well, I, mean, I, was gonna, I was going to call on Jeremy Levitt because I've been overlooking this side of the room. Are you, That's okay. That's we, okay. We, yeah, we can. Okay. We can. Yes. All right. <laughs> we, will give a, uh, we will give the last word to Harold Kemp, and then we'll adjourn to have uh, a little food and drink. Um, this may be the most important thing I say, although it will, it will come across as, as uh, maudlin, <laughs> which is that. Um, <clears throat> When I was a uh, practicing lawyer in Washington, uh, just out of a clerkship, looking to get into international law, uh, I, I came to the American Society of International Law. And I remember at the annual meeting, <clears throat> about the time when I was looking for a job, uh, Ted Stein, the late Ted Stein, who died tragically young, said to me, how would you like to come to a gathering of young law professors? And I went and there was a dinner, and it was entirely his initiative out of his communal instincts. And there were 10 of us, 
And now we're all, you know, pretty seasoned law professors. And we've had a relationship over the years. When, when Ted died, and Laurie gave a tribute to him at the American Society, which was a very lovely tribute, she pointed out that uh, the irony that the longevity of international law professors is reflecting the people you see at these meetings, although Ted and she had expected to be friends together for many years. And what she was doing now was just encouraging everyone to remember that spirit. Uh, I think this is almost the most important thing that can come from the ASIL, from the uh, American Association of Law Schools, is for um, new entrants to the field to really build communities with each other uh, that are serious intellectual communities. You can stay in touch in a way now that was not possible before. You can share things. You can, uh, you know, people you practice law with, um, at offices like the legal advisor's office will go off to different places, but you'll stay together. And um, that is, I think, the great power uh, of, of, of sort of a community of international uh, lawyers um, that um, increasingly you see it, um, you know, and it, and it cuts across uh, national borders because of uh, LLMs and other people come here and then you all often become famous scholars in their own country. So I think that um, that's not something that can be generated. But if you have any doubts about whether this is a good idea, it's a great idea. And it's something that I think that uh, this is a lonely, individualistic business in which you're afraid of your superior, your seniors. And that on your own faculty, some of you might not get tenure. So that it, it, some of the incentives created are to be distrustful. But I think what you ought to do is try to cut across that to the extent possible because those people will stay with you for your entire career. And I think it, it, it just uh, makes a, a, for a very satisfying um, a career as well as a, a, a satif satisfying set of personal relationships. I can't think of a better note on which to end, so thank you very much.